The strangers from the internet are standing outside. The strangers from the internet have come from far and wide. But I cannot receive them. I hardly believe in them. Hello, and welcome back to Shadow Yaddo. I'm Elena Richardson. Are you traveling again? Thinking about traveling again? I am. I've always loved planning journeys, learning the contours of the world, whether the trip is imagined or real. As a kid, I was sort of obsessed with maps. My dad had been a sailor, and he would give me a task. What route would you take to sail from the Cape of Good Hope to Pondicherry? That sort of thing. And off I'd go to study maps and trace coastlines. These days, I find I'm looking at lots of maps again but not of the romantic, swashbuckling kind. Now it's maps that show global vaccination patterns, or COVID hotspots, or shifting borders filled with people held hostage by politics and military force. Beneath the skillfully drawn lines on the page, there's always an underbelly, a second, often third, narrative that the cartographer's pen didn't note. But our guests today do note what lies beneath the surface and they excavate it brilliantly in their work. Take librettist and playwright Sandra Seaton, who sent us a kind letter of thanks for her residency, along with a book, Black Opera, History, Power, Engagement, by Naomi Andre, a compelling exploration of then versus now that reframes how race, gender, sexuality, and nationhood shaped opera, and why that matters. The chapter, Haunted Legacies, focuses on Sandra's work as emblematic of opera's transformative power. Her song cycle, from the diary of Sally Hemings, composed by William Balcom, deconstructs the double narrative of how power is unequally experienced according to gender and race. As we now know, Sally Hemings was a slave owned by Thomas Jefferson, as well as the mother of many of his children. But very little is actually known about Sally's inner world or her day-to-day life. Here, along with selections from the song cycle, you'll hear Sandra on how she came to be a librettist, why she's moved to reimagine history, and how she inhabits the nuanced heart of such enigmatic figures. My life with music started when I was very young. My mother was a school teacher in the South in Tennessee, and uh, she would go out and teach in these in the one-room country school, and I would be there during the day with my grandmother Emma. So she had made up all kinds of things, and she would get me to perform, and she recited Paul Lawrence Dunbar all over town, and sang and played the piano. And I was always interested in writing, but I always thought of words and music together. The libretto, those words have to leave room for the music. For a very long time, we didn't see much or know much about African-American life, African-American stories of other periods, of other eras. I would read the encyclopedia when I was a little girl, and there would just be so few stories about African-Americans. You know, it was as if they didn't exist. Let and cry. 
I had never thought about writing anything about Sally Hemings. The only thing I knew about Sally Hemings was what you would call a uh, bodice ripper, that sort of thing. It really did not appeal to me. I thought about that, and then I thought about my own family. My great-grandmother, and it wasn't a plantation, she was born after slavery, but she was the daughter of the son of this well-to-do planter and the child of the cook. And she lived there, was brought up there in the house, and had a choice to pass for white or to go off and marry a black man. She chose to marry a black man, my, my great-grandfather, John. And so I knew about her and about everything that had gone on there. I was just thinking about that, and I was drawn to learn more about that world. Oh. I think there's probably a lot of things we take for granted now. When I went to college in the 60s, there were no books by black writers at all. There was one essay by James Baldwin, but it was Hemingway, Faulkner, and women, it would have been Catherine Ann Porter, Eudora Welty, important writers, and you could learn a lot from reading them, but that's not the point. There was no diversity. When I found a book like Brown Girl, Brown Stones, Apollo and Marshall, I felt cheated because there was nothing like that. And Toni Morrison's work hadn't been written, and Alice Walker's work hadn't been written. But Invisible Man had, and Invisible Man was not taught. What we have now, oh, these books, they're there. That's a big, big change. There is a real push with, say, Glimmerglass, for instance, to bring in diversity in a number of the regional opera companies, you know, Washington National Opera. There's more diversity now. But if you want to get more diversity, then the audiences need to be diverse and they need to demand it. And so what comes first, you know, the chicken or the egg, the audience or the programming? I think that it will happen, and I think it is starting to happen. It's not just Porgy and Bess anymore, but it is a problem with performers, with casting, and the bulk of the singers in opera, of course, they are highly capable of doing the standard repertoire, and they love getting to do stories that reflect their own community as well. Sandra Seton's new play, The Passion of Mary Cardwell Dawson, celebrates the founding of the historic and groundbreaking National Negro Opera Company in 1941 and will premiere as part of the Glimmerglass Festival in Cooperstown, New York, on August 5th. Her work, The First Blue Bird in the Morning, with composer Carlos Simon, was recently commissioned by L.A. Opera to be part of a series of short musical films, and Dreamland, Tulsa 1921, Sandra's collaboration with composer Dr. Marcus Garrett was commissioned by Turtle Creek Choral and will premiere next summer in Dallas and then travel to Carnegie Hall in New York City. Joyce Kozlov has long been renowned for her ability to fuse art with activism. Her opulent visual patterns and public installations are not only a feast for the eyes, but her work probes culture, politics, and social change. She is one of the founding members of the pattern and decoration movement, breaking down hierarchies of high art versus low art since the 1970s. She was also a founding member of the Heresies Collective, which published a quarterly journal about feminism, art, and politics. Joyce has long held a fascination with maps, and in the 1990s, cartography became the foundation for what she considers her private work. Painting, sculpture, collage, obsessed with knowledge, naming, and what lies beneath. Her current show, Uncivil Wars, draws from the U.S. Civil War battle maps, which she meticulously recrafted with contemporary vision. Here, 
she speaks with her fellow D.C. Moore artist, Alexi Worth. The New York Times had this to say about Alexi's work. Painted with sensuous neatness in a nicely simplifying representational style, Alexi Worth's pictures present curious visual puzzles, slyly charged with undercurrents. It's hard to think of another painter these days who has such infectious fun with the philosophical analysis of modern painting. In addition to painting, Alexei has written about art for The New Yorker, Art Forum, and Art in America, among others. Here's Alexei in conversation with Joyce. Whoa, what is it good for? Absolutely nothing. Whoa. What is it good for? Absolutely nothing. War ain't nothing but a heartbreaker. Joyce, I was just in your beautiful show yesterday, and my understanding is that you had a kind of a different show in mind, that you'd begun working on these 12 or 13 paintings or some of them, and that they took a turn that led to what they are now. And I'd love to have you describe what happened. They were Civil War related paintings, but now they're more than that. And maybe you could tell us kind of the story of the turn in the work. About three years ago, I went to Greenville, South Carolina, where I'm working on a public art project. The morning that I had the initial meeting with them, I woke up early in the hotel and I walked across the street to this massive cemetery going back to the 1600s, right up to the present. And the first thing you see is an obelisk and a statue and a cannon, all monuments to the Confederacy, which one expects, really. Mm -hmm. But then when I walked inside, there were about a hundred small gravestones, each of which had a cloth Confederate flag planted next to it, a new cloth a fresh Confederate, flag. a fresh yeah. one. And I started to hyperventilate. I had a very emotional reaction. Mm -hmm. It was the new flags that someone was perpetuating this that really frightened me yeah. and made me realize that for many people, this war is still going on. And now, three years later, we know this very well. But I was naive and I was in a state of shock. And a friend of mine said, you should really look at Civil War battle maps. So I did. Maps have always been a part of your work yeah, for decades. Yeah, and I've yeah. worked with battle maps before. Yeah, but not from the Civil War. And so I went online and I downloaded some and I ordered some books from Amazon. And they sat in my studio until a year ago when I had COVID and so did many other people. And all mm -hmm. of a sudden, I started painting these Civil War maps and putting these viral outbreaks mm -hmm. on them. And I was a little unsure of myself at first. Why am I doing this? So right at that time, the two things were together. Yes. The COVID, these kind of pincushion-like emblems of the virus and the colored transformed but very recognizable right. maps right. of battles. And so I had this pile of material. And meanwhile, I was working on the public art project in South Carolina. And in my mind, because of that initial warning, the two things are interconnected, although the subject matter is different and the, the, the material is different. It's just a psychological connection for me. And it's sort of funny that they're both opening at the same time. Yeah, well, maybe quickly tell us, because that's opening... On the 19th of July. It's a new building. I've done, you know, since the early 80s, many public art projects. This is maybe my most ambitious. There are 17 different very large panels. Panels. Eight of them are 14 feet high, and they go around this main entrance room into the federal courthouse. And I'm excited about it. It has to do with the history of textiles and labor in that region. Anyway, so that's the background for these paintings. And the show came about very fast. I really wasn't quite finished with the series. And then a friend from Italy came to my studio, and she started shouting, 
you have to show these now. These are very timely. You told me that. I love that story. I love that. That's the kind of studio visitor we all need sometimes to say like, hey, this is urgent. This is connected to the present in a way that not every artwork is. Yeah, yeah. Maybe we should just briefly describe. So there are, I think, three excerpts from three earlier bodies of work, some of which have been shown before, but all of them having to do with war and conflict and mapping. And one of the most charming to me is the one where you used your son Nick's childhood drawings of soldiers and, you know, kind of classic boys imagery. They're actually the battles of the superheroes from his comic books. That yeah. body of work is from 2003. I produced a book called Boys Art. I noticed from my childhood that my brothers were drawing battles. And then I saw this happening with my son. And it's not something that girls do. So it was my way of examining that. I think it's part of the formation of masculinity. And today, people tell me that their sons play video games. But anyway, I incorporated those drawings of my sons, which it was pre-Photoshop. Yeah. Uh, so I took them to my local copy shop and had them reduced down to very small and inserted them into these battle scenes. And then I inserted all kinds of uh, images of war from, from art history and from popular culture. They all have this quality of being a kind of idiosyncratic, encyclopedic look at a subject that your work has often has. But I love having in this show different vantage points on conflict. Some of it kind of, you feel kind of affectionate, familial, wry look at boys and childhood but others very serious. And there's a group that includes this statistic about the casualty rate in World War One. Yeah, so I'll explain okay. that. I happened to be in the Imperial War Museum in London, where I'd never been before. And there is a reconstructed World War I trench. And on the wall is the statistic that in World War I, nine out of 10 casualties were soldiers. But in today's wars, and this was 2008, nine out of 10 are civilians. Mm -hmm. I was very struck by that. And then I went into the gift shop and they were selling World War I trench maps that are beautiful. These were like worlds underground, very complex maps. And they're in the center of each of these pieces with the statistic. And these horrific death images, and they are from children's war toys called Warhammer a popular game among 13-year-old boys. And yeah. you buy these little soldiers from old wars and fantasy soldiers, and you paint them and you make these battles. The Warhammer store was on A Street, and I used to go there, me and the 13-year-old boys. I would buy the catalogs and cut them up and use them in my work. So the Manifest Destiny, those four images, each one, these horrific images of skulls and death heads, are piling up until there's a huge mass of them in the fourth image. Yes, there's a kind of beautiful, gruesome pile of skulls. These are fictional, and yet they have, in a way, a, a more vivid gruesomeness for being quasi-invention. I think maybe we should push on to the show itself, the 13 paintings. There's a lot of things I wanted to ask you, and one of them is just the, their beauty, because your work is often visually opulent, and this group especially, they're each of them very distinctive in color, and maybe, maybe that's a place to focus on for a minute. It seemed to me that there's a color world that's very distinctive. Some of your groups of works and some of the ones that are in the show, you feel that there's a kind of palette for the series as a whole. But in this case, each one is its own color idiom. And I wondered how you thought about that. I'm glad you asked. I did. You know, the maps that I started with were black and white mostly. Mm -hmm. And these maps were made during the war by soldiers and officers on both sides. Uh, some of them actually have bloodstains on them. Some of the people who made them died in one of these battles. How do you take something like that and make a painting out of yeah. it? And there are certain map colors, you know, like the land is green and the water is blue, and I wanted to get away from that. And so I approached each one a little differently, but especially the color, and I'm glad you mentioned that. I mean, I really tried to work at that. Yeah, the way that Vicksburg, for instance, has this kind of beautiful midnight blue world, and Chattanooga is all velvety, warm browns, and then Appomattox is maybe the most opulent, the most kind of like 
outdoing, you know, 80s Frank Stella for sheer kind of explosive, <laughs> giant, high chroma. Yeah, well, that was the end of the war when they signed the armistice. And, you know, it's a very sad moment after the horrific amount of death. But it was also a happy moment, mm -hmm. at least for the North, that it was finally over. The color in a lot of them had sometimes an emotional goal. But that brings up, to me, a kind of fascinating underlying question about the relationship between information and I don't know, maybe formalism or design or purely pictorial imperatives. As a viewer, it's hard to figure out, and it feels like you're simultaneously responding to the information in, in the way that you were just starting to suggest, where you're really thinking about Appomattox, for instance. But at other times, it feels like you're deciding to be irresponsible or untethered to information <laughs> or the, the meaning of these things. Uh -huh. And I, I'd love to know more about how that decision-making process, or it feels like a kind of a spectrum of content-driven and, and content-free decision-making. Is that right? I think it may be more irrational than you think it is. <laughs> I guess I spent an average of about a month on each one. I had them all hanging around me in the studio, and then some of them I went back into because there's something didn't feel right about them. I mean, that's something that we all do in our studios. Uh -huh. I wanted to say something about detail because it's like on my mind. It's sitting there and painting them, some of them are very detailed. For whatever reason, I'm compelled to keep all the details that are in the original. And for the ones that in many, many, many names on them. As I'm sitting there writing them, I began to realize that these were not towns and villages. These were names of people. And so every house was on the map. And I guess the people who mapped the counties, why did they need the names of all these individuals? And, and, and maybe for the armies, having that information was useful to find out if, you know, and then some of them, that there is a house and it says vacant. Maybe their soldiers could sleep there that night or something. Uh, or maybe they would see who their friends were. Uh, I don't really know. I'm speculating. But as I'm writing all these names, I suddenly realize they are all Anglo-Saxon names. And then thinking about the waves of immigration that happened after the Civil War in this country and that how much more homogeneous the country was. Yeah, it was the was. old Anglo-America. Uh, right. And the other thing that struck me, doing Antietam. Antietam is a very detailed map. There's a line for every Confederate and every Union grave. And this is the battle where there were the most casualties, over 20,000. But there's this other little mark, and there's a little chart at the bottom, and I look at it, and it's for dead horses. Wow. And I don't know, I just, that really hit me. So I Google how many horses died during the Civil War. There were 1.5 million horse and mule casualties. I mean, the level of cruelty, it just boggles the mind. Yeah, it's sometimes those kinds of peripheral statistics that can bring it home in a way that the more familiar numbers don't, yeah. So all of this is part of it, somehow buried in there, in symbolic, abstract language. And I do think these are abstract paintings. Both the viruses and the maps are in a kind of abstract language. The images of the viruses were online, and I downloaded them, and they don't really look like that because they color them. They're not necessarily those colors that we're seeing all the time. So, so it gets at the crux of something that interests me about your work and, and about the movement that you started or helped to start, Pattern and Decoration, which simultaneously absorbs, want, was interested in celebrating and using the kind of non-art traditions of all that are global, that are not part of the kind of narrow Western canon but is also completely involved with abstraction and the Western canon's way of looking at things, that you wanted to be able to do both. In, and so maybe in something like the way that here, you want to have all this information, all this history, all this literal numbers of dead horses, while also just sheerly enjoying color relationships at an optical level. And it feels like 
all art has some of that duality of kind of this is a little bit more content driven this is a little bit more just for our eyes but yours especially puts those things into a kind of very stark juxtaposition where there's information 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 and then um opticality and they're bang up against each other and they always yeah. have been. you know i had a show of maps small frescoes called knowledge and they were based on old maps that were wrong roberta smith wrote in a review she called it pattern and information that was around 1990 <laughs> yeah. i have tried yeah. to in my mind understand the relationship between the decorative work that i did and then the cartographic work Yes, both of them are systems of visual art, which are not what we know as high art, and I'm putting them into a painting context. I like that the minor arts are carriers of popular culture and information. My impulse, I guess, is rather formal to transform them into something that reads as within the tradition that I grew up of Western yeah. painting. Yeah, well, I love pattern and information. I didn't remember reading that as a kind of no, uh, why would you? altered version of the name of the movement. Yeah. To me, it connects back. We were talking earlier where the viewer is left to decide how far do I keep reading here? How much can I take in? When do I just step back and enjoy it in terms of pattern? And when do I step forward? In which case, you know, you could spend hours with each of your maps. Yeah, and... In all my work, particularly the public art, there is the the overall that you maybe grasp from across the room, and then maybe you're lured up to the surface to explore the details. And I know that some people will be and some people won't. I know from experience. But you're making work for both audiences, not not just for one. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, you, you have to, you know, you don't have your ideal audience. No, but I think some artists work for an ideal audience. And to me, that's legit, too, to say that, like, other people might enjoy it, but there is a core group of eyes. They're the ones I care about. Milton had this thing about fit audience, though few. Joyce, I wonder whether pattern and decoration seems increasingly in the last 10 years to have more and more resonance for younger artists and for many artists, I think, globally. Do you still feel like the premise of that, the thinking behind when you and Bob Kushner and others started thinking this way, do you feel like you're still working within it? Or does this work, for instance, push outside of what you would have expected or thought about back in the 70s? Well, I would say both and. <laughs> <laughs> we were young artists and we were thumbing our noses at the current dominant artistic style. But we were serious, and each of us had our passions that we were exploring. And we've all gone in different directions since. There's this pendulum swing. Now this kind of richness and density is something that younger artists are exploring, and, and I do see it everywhere. And I also think that what you said about globally, artists everywhere are looking at their own traditions, and many of them are decorative traditions. And I find that very exciting and also gratifying, because we were very maligned in those years. Well, decoration is such a pejorative term in our world still now. I mean, if you were in a crit in art school and you said something's decorative, that's not a mixed term. Well, that was the worst thing you could say when I was in art school. I thought we had changed that to some extent. But you know, when people are just talking to me about some whatever subject and they use the word decorative pejoratively, suddenly a, an expression comes over their face like they <laughs> knew they may have insulted me and they say, oh, in the bad <laughs> sense of the word. <laughs> Oh, peace, love, and understanding Tell me, is there no place for them today? They say we must fight to keep our freedom But Lord, 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 there's got to be Joyce Kozlov, Uncivil Wars, is on view at D.C. Moore Gallery in New York City through August 13. Visit dcmoorgallery.com for previews of work by both Joyce and Alexei. And if you're in Greenville, South Carolina, check out Joyce's mosaic panels on textiles and labor inside the new federal courthouse. Thanks for tuning in. Big thanks to our producer, Christy Albano, 
sound engineer CJ DeGenero, and to the artists who contributed music. In order of appearance, they are Joseph Keckler for the adaptation of our theme music, Strangers from the Internet, composer William Balcom and librettist Sandra Seaton for selections from The Diary of Sally Hemings, including They Say I Was Born Old, White Waves, and My Sister Ghost. The full album is available on iTunes. And we thank Joan Osborne for her rendition of the Motown classic, War. In parting, we'll leave you with some wonderful advice intended for young artists, but applicable to all. Again, here's Sandra Seaton. Believe in yourself and believe that you are capable of doing things. And if people like your work, it's not an accident. It's not that they really are just trying to be nice or they don't know what they're really doing. It's difficult when you're young to have that kind of confidence in yourself. And of course, you can't take rejection as the final word. You just have to keep on. You have to just stay in there and keep working on it. And I remember I had a professor named Webb Smalley. He was a a theater professor when I was at Illinois. He was always saying, when are you going to write that play? And I was like running from him because I thought, oh, Professor Smalley, you know I can't do that. And he believed in me. But then you have to believe when you get this positive feedback, you have to be willing to accept that, you know, it's that that this is somebody that thinks that you can do it. And and, uh, that's very important. So there's no such thing as the background for being a writer. You can't rule out your own environment as not being worthy and pull from it. By the time you're in your 20s, you've probably lived enough and experienced enough to write for the rest of your life. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you for more Shadow Yaddle in just a couple of weeks.